Buddhai, Namo Dhammai, Namo Sanghai. Jai Vim to all and welcome to the Navayana Buddhist Sangha short dialogue. And today we will discuss the very principal concept in Buddhism called Trisarna, meaning taking refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma and Sangha. We have with us a Professor Bodhi to reflect on this issue. And I would like to know from him that when the world in all religion, when people are worshipping the God and uh, in Buddhism, people are, people are taking the refuge. In this context, what exactly uh, this means by Trisarna? What uh, entails to go for refuge? And what does it mean to embrace the Buddha, the Dhamma, and Sangha. I request you to please reflect on this very initial principle in Buddhism called Tri Sarna. Please, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Sujit, uh, for another round of discussions, which I think are very important uh, from the side of the Navayana Buddhist Sangha, which we all belong to. Uh, this topic is a very interesting topic, as in the sense of what does T Sarana mean? What does it mean to take refuge? You know, and we can discuss the details of it. But before we go into the little bit of the detail, it's just kind of important for us to go back to Baba Saheb and why Baba Saheb himself converted and embraced the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. There are many reasons. Many of us call Baba Sahib's conversion to Buddhism as a masterstroke. And you can look at it from a political perspective. You can look at it from an economic perspective, a historical perspective, a cultural, even a discursive perspective. But to me personally, one of the reasons which I really kind of, you know, attracts me in terms of uh, why Baba Sahib actually embraced the Buddha Dhamma Sangha was because I think that Baba Sahib saw in Buddhism out of the many choices that were available in terms of religion, he saw in Buddhism as the only religion that was compatible with science. Buddhism is the religion that can stand the tests of science. And for them, for him, this is fundamental. This is very important. Because he saw in Buddhism a future, a future in which, in which reason and rationality will arise, rooted in what is called reason and experience. And Baba Sahib was also attracted to this idea of this teacher, Shakyamuni, who, who himself stated that what I teach is not always correct and binding. You know, Come and taste it for yourself. Just because it came from me doesn't have to mean that it is correct and binding to you. You want, there's a beautiful word in Buddhism called Ehi Pasiko. Come, come and taste it for yourself. So even before we begin to think a little bit about taking refuge, we must understand the overarching vision that Baba Sahib has of why we should take refuge into this particular framework. Now, the Buddha Dhamma Sangha is, is a beautiful framework. Some of us call it a frame of reference. You know? And when you say a frame of reference, we are, we are referring it as constitutive of many, many, many categories and concepts and so on and so forth. That's so intrinsically linked. If you go deep, as we have discussed in the earlier video, if you go deep in the Buddha Namasana, you realize that you begin to experience the reality as it is, the subtle truths and the relative reality. There are so many things to experience once you take refuge. But what is important just to note, at least today's discussion is that when we say we take refuge, we must always remember that as Buddhists, what it actually means is that we are followers and refuge takers in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. We should never be reductionistic in the sense that we should not reduce the Buddha Dhamma Sangha to Buddhism. Buddhism is a new concept that came, you know, a hundred years back for us. And it was used in the Western context in order to kind of reduce the whole Buddha Dhamma Sangha into one particular idea, which is called the Buddha and the ism taught by the Buddha. But we who practice, we know that, that it's not what it is. Because what it is, is that we, you become a Buddhist when you take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma. And not even the Buddha Dhamma, but the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. And if you go a little bit into details, it is all connected. You can never put the Buddha on top of the Dhamma, on top of the Sangha. These are just in a continuum, you know, one line. And each of them are connected by a dot. You cannot isolate one of the concepts from these three. 
interconnected concepts that then makes the frame of reference in buddhism now this this buddha dhamma sangha as a framework as a frame of reference you know it 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 opens up when i use the word frame of reference i'm talking about concepts and categories and ways of looking at the world or ways of engaging with the world ways of perceiving the world you know all of us have a frame of reference it is rare for a human being not to have a frame of reference to look at the world and this tiratana buddha dhamma sangha is our frame of reference now this frame of reference is like a door you see it's like a door it's like when you open the door na everything that was invisible that you could not see suddenly you can see the reality it's like a window you open the window on a particular sunny day and the minute you open your window you see everything in reality blue sky it's probably the rain it's probably the birds probably the trees you know wind and so on and so forth so this framework is like it's like a beautiful window once you open you can you can avail yourself of 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 many many things that are invisible to you so but we must uh, remember one thing about this is that you cannot you cannot learn the buddha dhamma sangha and even the act of taking refuge in the tiratana by heart this is not something you learn by heart buddhism you don't you don't learn buddhism by heart in buddhism you learn by discovery and this discovery is very important it should be actually in my in my understanding it should be embodied in our, in our culture you know buddhism is a discovery and should be embodied in every child's mind should be in every every one who calls oneself a buddhist should be on the path of discovery always part of learning part of knowing part of trying to understand things more part of you know this this experiment this discovery that we we must have as as buddhist so so it is in that particular sense you know when you begin to discover you who who see whoever embrace the, this particular framework you know, whoever embrace this framework one beautiful thing about this framework is that it does not demand you to condemn you who you are it doesn't it doesn't condemn your past it doesn't condemn a culture it doesn't condemn your your earlier reality it simply says the minute you take refuge in this whoever you are doesn't matter you can become beautiful you can grow into a beautiful human being you can grow into a immortal being you can grow into a beautiful being so that is the reason that wherever the buddha dhamma sangha as a framework has gone to various regions and geographies of the world all it has done it has made those cultures beautiful the buddha dhamma sangha was embraced by the tibetans it became tibetan buddhism beautiful flowering of buddhism it went to china it became chan buddhism you know it went to japan it became zen buddhism then there was a rise of pure land it went to thai it became thai buddhism it went to europe now and it's become secular buddhism wherever this framework is embraced by whatever culture from that context of that culture arises a way of experiencing and a way of looking and a way of engaging and a way of thinking and a way of living. this is the reason why in buddhism we don't have conflicts with each other the tibetans will not have conflict with us we will not have conflict with the secular buddhists secular buddhists will not have conflict with the zen buddhists you know because in buddhism buddhism is a very contextual kind of a religion it is rooted to a context it is from this context arises it is not an imposition on or a framework that imposes itself on the other it cannot do that there is nothing universal in buddhism if there is one thing that is universal in buddhism it is wisdom and the argument is that when you look at the buddhist framework and you go deeper you will realize one thing that in buddhism this dukkha and pain and suffering and lamentation and grief is a very personal experience the minute this particular body that experiences all of these pain and lamentation and grief begins to engage with the social reality use language engage in meaning making seek purpose mid you enter that particular domain it becomes a binary world a world in which language is fundamental and binary principles are fundamental to language itself and the minute you begin to search for truth in this binary world for a buddhist this truth in the binary world is always multiple there cannot be one truth in this world especially you know in the cultural realm in the realms of language the realms of 
social life. There cannot be one truth. There are multiple, and there will always be multiple truths. The truths of the Tibetans will be their truths. The truths of the Indians will be their truths. The truths of Japanese will be their truths. There might be differences there. There might be tension there, you know, because even within the Japanese, there are many other cultures. Even among Tibetans, there are many other schools. But they're not in conflict with each other because each of them appreciate this one single idea of Buddhism that it is contextual in nature. It is the context from where Buddhism is born. And this loose frame that goes and you embrace and it seeps into like water and then you grow again. So in this particular sense, you know, if you look at taking refuge, so the beauty is that Buddhism is like it's like a massive garden with beautiful flowers, all with their different shapes and sizes, all with their different colors, all with the, each emitting a beautiful and amazing scent. None is demanding that the other should be like me. None is creating a hierarchy that I am better than you and you must follow me. You know, none is imposing and saying that I am better than you and you are less better than me. In Buddhism. Buddhism is a thousand flowers blooming yeah, and each appreciating the diversity of the value and the beauty of, of each and every flower. And this is exactly what Buddhism does. It appreciates these diversities. It makes diversities beautiful. And the way the whole knowledge framework is structured, it's structured in a manner in which we can learn and enrich from each other. I'm an, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an Indian and a follower of Baba Sahib and a follower of Buddhism. I appreciate the richness of Tibetan Buddhism. I, there's so much to learn from Tibetan Buddhism. And this is how exactly the framework works. But there is a small bit of limitation in the sense that because it is contextual in nature and the context gives rise to a particular way of looking, way of thinking, a way of practicing, we should not borrow from someone else. Like I cannot borrow a particular practice from another region and hope to impose myself and hope to gain freedom and emancipation and social emancipation and freedom of mind by borrowing someone else's frame. What Baba Seb did was beautiful. He rooted it back this framework that was lost in this country for 2,500 years. And the minute he rooted it back, now it is starting to grow again. So it is in this sense, you know, that you can see a lot of appreciation among Buddhists, a lot of, uh, you know, enriching among Buddhists. You will not feel too much conflict among Buddhists. There is. I'm not saying there is not. There's no need to deny that. But there's less of conflict within the schools of Buddhism. There's so many schools. In India now, we are going, you know, the beautiful school. So in that sense, if you look at what Baba Sahib was looking at, you know, he was very attracted to this contextual nature of Buddhism, this processual nature of Buddhism, always in the process of moving and changing and becoming better, and becoming beautiful, you know, always rooted in reason, always rooted in experience, you know. These were the things that generally were very, very attractive to Baba Sahib. So there are a lot more to discuss about taking refuge, but this is the basic idea that uh, we need to kind of reflect on today. And the last point is on to mention that, you know, like, if you ask me very frankly, why is it that we should take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha? Source from Baba Sahib's own vision about freedom of mind and social emancipation. It is simply this. We embrace the Buddha Dhamma Sangha the way he had shown us. Not to forget our past. Not even to erase our past. Probably not even to fix our past. We embrace the Buddha Dhamma Sangha in order to reclaim our humanity. In order to become human again. You know, there is something very beautiful in this, this way of looking in the sense that once you move from another frame of reference to another frame of reference we call Buddhism, in that frame of re reference lies your freedom and emancipation, lies your reclamation of what you call the humanness or humanity itself. So it is in that way probably we should kind of look at this taking refuge. The situation is a very political situation we're living in. And we must be careful. Our Buddhism is not an apolitical Buddhism. It should not turn us into apolitical beings. Our Buddhism should make it alive to our political reality. Because that is so much a force that impacts us on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you go to the roots of it all, much, much beyond the binary political relative reality that we live in, lies our emanc emancipation and freedom at the most deepest level. A freedom that comes 
from embracing a frame of reference that helps you reclaim your humanity. So let me stop here, Sujit, uh, for today. I think uh, we can discuss more, but uh, I think these few words should suffice uh, for just this reflection about T Sarana, you know, taking refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. There are some beautiful suttas that we should read, but probably in the next time when we meet again, we can discuss it further. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your reflection on the new live frame of references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, we will come back to you with new uh, short dialogues uh, of Navayana Buddhist Sangha. Thank you all.